Do you recall your response to hearing President Reagan call the Soviet Union an evil empire? I remember this very well uh, because, of course, we couldn't get access to the speech. But as the Soviet leadership was so angry and afraid, then they, of course, uh, wrote a lot of about uh, this in the in the newspapers, attacking it. And uh, there was, of course, sometimes it was possible to listen to Radio Free Europe or American Voice, where we got the news also. And it was one of the best news what we had. Uh, when you lived in the Soviet uh, system under the oppression, uh, then uh, we always wondered why the people, the Western leaders of the leaders of the free world, never called it by name. And it was so good to hear, to find the first man, first president, really to call the evil by name. This was the evil empire. This was the first but most important step because to fight the evil down, you first must name it and Ronald Reagan did it. And uh, as the communist authorities were really very angry on this speech, then the people in the captive countries, uh, it gave enormous hope to see at last the President of the United States who tells the truth and who is uh, not afraid to tell the truth. Could you describe your feeling, your, your, the moment when you first heard that? Oh, that was mostly the same, so thank God. At least somebody is saying it. And this was really the big relief and really the new hope, uh, what it came to us to, to fight, to resist uh, this system. And um, in connection with this, uh, I first time really remember uh, when I understood that the fall of the Soviet Union will not be so far away. We were always sure that it will go down because we saw how rotten the system is. Uh, but uh, as the West did nothing for uh, decades and decades, then it looked that it will stay for there for a long time. And uh, President Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Pope John Paul II were like a really fresh air. And uh, they changed the world. And, uh, and which the most important when I understood that the system will go down when as we were trained as a Soviet officers in the university, so you had to spend one mm, a day in the week uh, to be trained as a Soviet military officer. And sometimes they sent some very high rank officers from the Moscow to tell about the political situation, military situation, and so on. And it was a little bit after the evil empire speech when they sent uh, somebody from the Moscow military academy, very high rank general, to talk to the students in very secretly. And of course, then we really all of us understood that the Soviet Union will go down quicker as uh, anybody has expected. Because we first time saw the Soviet general who was absolutely afraid of something. And they were afraid of Ronald Reagan. They told us, you see, we are in very dangerous situation now. Those uh, stupid Americans have elected the real cowboy to the president. He's a real cowboy, he's a real man. He can push the button, he can push the button. And now he puts those weapons to the space and they can annihilate, they can annihilate all Moscow and uh, everything can go down very quickly. And we first time really saw that they are afraid of somebody. And uh, as all the Soviet system or the communist system based only on the fear, why it stayed so long? Because uh, they killed so many people they tortured so many people, they sent so many people to their Siberia, and the result was that everybody was afraid. And how to fight, how this, uh, the changes happened, the people had to overcome the fear. But the first of feeling to overcome the fear, you see that those communists are afraid themselves. And this was a great feeling. And this was the, we can say this was the start of end of the Soviet Union. What was, like, what was life like under a communist regime? It's very hard to describe. Even when we try to describe this to our children, it's sometimes uh, hard to do because their life was just absolutely unnormal. Uh, the human mind tries to think in the normal way. To explain the unnormal world is very hard because the people are not even understanding the, the smallest things. It's, uh, it's so really stupid in, in many ways. In other ways, it's so dangerous. But uh, I, for example, tried once to explain to my son when he was small, some six, seven years old, uh, what was the life in the Soviet Union. And we just happened to talk that in the Soviet Union there was not possible to get the bananas. 
to the to the children. And we started from this point, and and I asked, now you see, you have a lot of you can have eat the bananas and so on, and that. And, but in the Soviet time, when I was a child, it was not possible. And then he started to think, and he also knew that some things was forbidden in the Soviet Union, like the books or, or the movies or the whatever theater pieces or music or so on. And then he asked, were they forbidden? No, I, no, I said, no, they were not forbidden. And then he think, and then he moved to the market economy system and said, but didn't we have the money? And he said, I know we theoretically had the money. And then he got really trouble, but, but why they were not available then? And I get trouble to answer this question because it's really hard to explain why they were not available because this system was just so stupid. Did you but live in fear? Did you live in fear? In a lot of fear, yes, because everybody were afraid. And again, every personal story in the communist system is how you overcome your fear and how you become really free. Because when it once happens, when you're not afraid anymore, then you have the power. And it really moved step by step, starting from the events very much abroad. I must say John Paul II was one of the first who came with the message, uh, be not afraid. The events in Poland, in solidarity movement, was the first such of uh, moments when we saw that it can last. It's, it's not possible to destroy it anymore. And the Ronald Reagan approach to support the solidarity, not in the words, but in reality, Solidarity was the first opposition movement which survived because they survived the first because no other opposition movement were supported by the West. We had in Estonia the Forest Brothers in Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, everywhere. We fought 10 years against the Soviet oppression, the partisan war uh, in, the, in the Baltic swamps and forest. All those people died. Nobody came to help them. And uh, nobody helped the Hungarians when they went to the uprising. Nobody helped the Czechs when they went uh, against the Soviet system. So we mostly lost the hope that the West will do something. And President Reagan was the first who really started to do something, not only in the words, but he started to change something. He really uh, started to encounter the Soviets everywhere, in the, even in the small places like in Granada and so on. It was so such an event for us also. In, in our country, because that was the first time when the Americans literally liberated somebody from the communists. They really intervened, they really did something. And this was, this was really very good to see because it gave a lot of hope. In 1987, when he asked uh, Gorbachev to tear down the wall, do you recall your reaction? Where were you at the time when you heard the speech? No, we didn't, still in this time, didn't hear the speech. Uh, we got the news afterwards. But soon then we had a strong resistance movement. Mostly in the same times when he had the speech, we had the first political demonstrations. We had the first such a big political gatherings in Estonia, first clashes with the militaries and with the military police and KGB. Uh, most probably in the, uh, when it was exactly held, uh, this, uh, which date, the Berlin Wall speech. 1987, 19 June, June, 1987. Yes, exactly, when in the June we were preparing the first big rally of the independent youth organizations, uh, which were called the Estonian Heritage Society, actually. <laughs> the same name in the English translation as the Heritage Society here in the United States. But we didn't know then. then. Uh, but uh, we had just the first, one of the first reorganized, uh, uh, not official movements, uh, which was in the territory of the Soviet Union. And we were prepared for the big gathering, the first big gathering of this uh, special uh, youth groups around the country. And uh, that was, had to be held in September. And it was uh, closed. It was not forbidden. All this territory where we had this meeting, there was, uh, uh, they sent the military troops in, they sent the military police in, they sent enormous amount of KGB uh, in. And uh, uh, we nevertheless went there. And <laughs> there was not too much people who gathered at the end. But uh, there was one service in the church. And I remember always that was the moment when my fear went totally uh, away. Because when we came out from the church, the KGB has lined in two lines in the front of the church. So that was, as we said, like in the Hollywood. 
uh, like in the Oscar ceremony. So they had the cameras, they had the photo cameras, the video cameras, everything. And they filmed and photoed everybody who came out from the search from both sides. So it was like a red carpet reception in the Hollywood. So you were filmed, filmed, clicked, clicked, clicked everywhere. And, uh, and in this moment, <laughs> you suddenly understood it was so stupid. It was so laughable. They had all the power. They had all the militaries, the spits nuts, uh, everybody ready for the, and there was not so many people from us. And they were more afraid as we were, actually. And suddenly you un understood that you're not afraid anymore at all. So that's, that was a very much changing point. And I remember we, with my wife, made the jokes that we are never, somebody has never taken so many photographs from us in our life. And it will be very interesting sometimes in the archives to look on those photos. And now, by accident, we have got the photos. <laughs> That's uh, because they were found by uh, when the KGB was not uh, gave the archives over in Estonia, but some parts of the archives were somehow disappeared. And now they are found step by step. And uh, we, some years ago, those photos from the same day, which were made on, on, on us, at least part of them were found. So it was such a uh, very interesting story. Very interesting. What is your view of Russia's progress toward democracy? And related to that, how do you feel about the effectiveness of the current leadership? Uh, Russian leadership or, or the Russian world leadership? leadership. No, Russian uh, leadership is quite effective to kill the democracy uh, currently. They are quite effective in this. There was a movement towards democracy when the Soviet Union went down in the first years of Yeltsin and so on. Uh, unfortunately, during the during the current leadership, there has been development in the opposite direction. We can call it, as they call it, controlled democracy or no democracy at all. So it's, uh, it's a very disturbing picture because there are not many countries in the world who have moved towards the democracy and now moving away from the democracy. And Russia is unfortunately one of uh, such of countries. And that's, uh, that's not good news because uh, it doesn't let the Russia to develop. It's a bad for the world where the Russia goes down again to the problems. And the way how the Soviet Union went down, and mostly in the same way, trying to build the empires, trying to build a huge military, and taking all the resources away from the, from the country, which will be used, needed actually, for the reconstruction of the country. And uh, the war against the Georgia, uh, such of uh, pressure on Ukraine, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's all quite bad and it demands a very clear response from the Western uh, uh, side. So actually, to be very frank, we, we very much need the new Ronald Reagan there. Uh, what needs, so, so my next question was, what needs to happen? Well, that would be the new Ronald Reagan, your, 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 what you basically just said, and that's obviously not right what we're seeing today. There was a recent open letter to the Obama administration signed by numerous former presidents and foreign, foreign ministers of Central and Eastern Europe uh, decrying the lack of attention the U.S. is paying to the NATO alliance. Their fear in part stems from what they discern as a belittling of issues of importance to their countries and the reset of Russian and U.S. relations. Would you agree with this concern, or is this fear, fear overplayed? As I signed the letters, then I, I agree absolutely what is written there. And um, when I was uh, offered to become part of this letter and to discuss how it must be written, then, uh, of course, I first thought, what is the sense to write a letter to the, to the President of the United States? Uh, can something done? Um, but I must say this letter had a quite strong influence, which was positive. And seeing that at least the Vice President be then in the Central and Eastern Europe and, uh, and looking on his promises and looking on non speeches, it was, the, it was the better as it was before, we can say it. But of course, the situation is, as such, is disturbing because when there are countries which are uh, working against the human rights, against the democratic freedoms and so on, it must be said, you couldn't be silent. One of the biggest strengths of the Ronald Reagan was that he was frank. He was frank and he said what is wrong. He didn't say this in the unpolite way. He didn't uh, misuse uh, this power, what he had. But uh, 
power of the speech, power of the word is very important for the United States president not to become silent, to have courage to say the truth. And that is important because that was the main weapon of the Ronald Reagan and he used this weapon excellently. And uh, he gave the support to the people who were oppressed. He actually made it clear what is wrong to the, to the leaders of these countries where something was wrong. And there are where the changes start. The who are ruling the country, they understand that something is wrong. At least they hear clearly that yes, there is something wrong. From other point of view, the people who are oppressed have more courage to raise to talk themselves, to support these uh, positive changes in their countries. So to tell the truth is, is a power. And, uh, and I think uh, Ronald Reagan used it well. And uh, I really hope that there will become the leaders who will follow his footsteps. You are a founding member of the Foundation for the Investigation of Communist Crimes. Can you summarize the extent of communist criminal activity in the last 80 years? And do you think the world underestimates the damage perpetrated by those communist regimes? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, uh, I think the world is not yet understood what it really was. I think uh, I don't want to undermine the crimes of all other uh, totalitarian regimes, or the Nazis, or fascists, or the right wing, or whatsoever. But when we compare how many people have killed by the communists, uh, then it's actually take all the other killings together and then uh, double it. And then you get the amount of uh, victims of the communist terror. It's such a huge that it must be understood. But when you go to the street in Europe, in the Los Angeles, where the people are still walking around with the Che Guevara t-shirts and so on, and uh, you ask what the communists have done, or who killed more, the Nazis or communists, That's, nobody says that the communists have done something like this. The people just don't know, or they are not interested to know. And I am really afraid that it's still connected with the politics so much. The people are afraid of this uh, truth. They want to be politically correct. Uh, Ronald Reagan was probably one of the first presidents of the United States after the Second World War who was not politically correct. And he, he told the truth. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's which is big change. We are trying to, to deliver this message uh, so large as we can what really happened under the communism. And I am in this sense happy that looking on the last uh, three years uh, when we have worked, that's not, of course, our work. We have been one who have tried to organize a little bit the similar groupings around the world. We see the positive development. We see the, the first steps, especially in the Europe, where the European Parliament has condemned the communist crimes now officially. That's in the same way how it has been done with the Nazi crimes and so on. These are only the first steps, of course. You get the political recognition of this, but now we must teach the people. We must teach the uh, younger generation. We must tell them what happened and tell in the way that they can understand that it's really possible only through the stories, through the personal memories, through the personal stories, the testimonies of the people. And uh, when we can deliver this and deliver in the mode which is modern, through the graphic novels, through the movies, through the whatever what is the modern uh, way. Uh, and that's, uh, then it starts to work. Uh, again, we need the similar movies on the, like is made, what made the world to understand what was Holocaust, how terrible it was. We need the similar movies like the Schindler list on the Gulag, on the Forest Brothers who fought uh, this hopeless uh, partisan warfare against uh, the Soviets because uh, that's never told. That's never told story. And it must be told to people to understand what really happened, how it happened, how the Soviet Union was crushed, how this evil empire was crushed. Because when we are not understanding this, we couldn't stand against the new evil empires. The evil has not gone away from the world, unfortunately. It's still there. And to fight it, to to really to get it down peacefully, without the war, without the huge bloodshed. We need to know how it was done before, because the Ronald Reagan, through all his work, through all his uh, action, demonstrates how it was done. Until it's not understood how it was done, it's very hard to do it again. So if you were to tell your son how it was done? No, actually, he, he, he more or less remembers. I think that's, the, first of all, be honest. 
tell the truth. I think that's the first step on everything. And, uh, and be not afraid. Uh, that's, uh, when it's not uh, understood, when the people are afraid to tell the truth, when they think that it's not popular, it's not politically correct or whatsoever, then actually nothing is achieved. So how has President Reagan influenced your leadership style? <laughs> Uh, some people are saying that it, uh, some leaders like Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan influenced my style too much <laughs> because uh, uh, I am, I tried, yes, I think they influenced in, in many things. First of all, don't give too much attention on the public opinion. Do what is the right thing to do. Uh, and uh, that I really try to follow because um, that's most important. When you have your agenda, and even when you are resisted, as President Reagan was resisted and criticized through most of his time, and Margaret Thatcher even more, uh, then uh, they nevertheless did what was necessary to do against all criticism, against all odds. And uh, it's, it's sometimes very hard to explain to the people how you get your economy up when you are taking your taxes down. It's um, theoretically, it's, it's very hard to explain. Uh, and you're only possible solution is to do it, just do it, and then to look how it starts to work. And from this point, I very much learned on my tax reform programs under President Reagan. We just had to do it, uh, not looking too much on the criticism or on the analysis that it's wrong and it's bad and it doesn't work. When I was sure that it will work then, and I am in the office where I must do this, then it's my job to, to deliver. And um, in, many, in many areas, I tried to learn uh, from the Brent Reagan activities uh, and, uh, and to do the, the same, same things. The other, of course, where we were quite much common was the Milton Friedman and the teachings of Milton Friedman when uh, I just tried to, to follow also very much in, in my economical reform policy and so on. But at the same time, there was a lot of more in the Reagan when I have started to read this and when I followed because he was he was a very moral person. The market economy sometimes is uh, is only looked at as such a liberal policy without any soul or without any heart. The Reagan Reagan had a very much heart, and he was a very moral person. And I think this was one uh, which uh, which was very useful to look and to learn because you must always know why you are doing this. You are doing this for the people. And the biggest achievement when you can change the people, the way how the people think, the way how the people feel. And, um, and that was uh, one important thing what uh, Ronald Reagan did in the United States. The, he changed really the minds of people in very much. And that's why he was successful. Well, you are essentially one of the founding fathers of democracy in Europe. Uh, ben Franklin, one of America's founding fathers, stressed to his colleagues that we must all hang together or assuredly we will all hang separately. Do you believe this idea applies to the republics in Europe today? And if so, what is necessary for this to occur? No, actually, I think that's, uh, that's very, that was very practical sentence then and it's practical sentence uh, also now. I think there are two parts in uh, Europe, for the Europe especially. First of all, we must hang really together in Europe, which means we must cooperate, we must find a common policy, we must find a common foreign policy, we must find a common energy policy, and without this, actually, we will be weak. We will not uh, couldn't, uh, achieve this position or achieve this what we, what we can, because Europe is a great continent. It's having enormous possibilities. Uh, we must use them better as we have done and using this uh, enlargement of Europe better as we have done, because it's a big engine for, for all the continent. But the second, uh, to hang together, it means to hang together for all the free world, for the Western world. I think the cooperation, Euro-Atlantic cooperation is a key for the success. And when we couldn't develop this, when we couldn't uh, hang there together also, this is a danger that uh, we couldn't achieve this, uh, at, uh, what we need for the whole world because uh, only when we hang really together we can solve those world uh, challenging problems, what we see. Uh, just moving on the separate ways as we have seen in the history, it's not helping, it's not practical. Even when you don't believe in the, 
in the Atlantic cooperation, just I always call to people, just be practical. And uh, that's the only practical way to get out uh, on these problems where we are and do something good for the world. Uh, we've gone over, so I don't want to keep you any longer. I know you have a car waiting for you, right? <laughs> Just have one quick question. What, what, what do you think is the greatest threat to democracy today? The greatest democracy is uh, the threat that the democracy doesn't know how strong it is. And when the democracy couldn't protect its interests, uh, protect the, uh, really the desire of people around the world to be free, then uh, we can all fail because democracy is again it's uh, it's a gentle it's you must uh, it needs to support to be to grow and without this support it will be just destroyed uh, but all the nations and all people in the world they want to to be free and uh, how to achieve this to believe that this is possible uh, i think one of the strengths again the president reagan was that he really believed in freedom he really believed that it's, uh, you can do it, you can achieve this. And uh, that was the, the, really the engine which uh, helped him to turn the world around. And uh, we must uh, believe the same thing today. We must believe this is possible. And to start to do this, the first of all, start to talk the truth.